And most of all, I invite you to have fun. These panelists are, have come here today to share their experiences with you. And um, now I'm going to invite the panelists to come on stage and talk about their magic. Let's make some noise for the panelists! Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yeah. I'm Paula De Cristofano. I'm a famous conservator at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And I'm thrilled that you're all here today. We're so pleased to be able to share what we do with an audience of students, of community, and uh, for you to find out what a museum career entails and what opportunities there might be for you. I started at the San Francisco Museum in 1990, when the museum was at the War Memorial Building on Van Ness across from City Hall. So I call myself one of the legacy staff people there. There's just a bunch of us that have been there long enough to have gone through all three manifestations of the building. The War Memorial <laughs> Studio, when we had a staff of just a few dozen people, we could all fit into one conference room. The Bota Building, which was constructed south of Market in the, and opened in 1995, our start, staff started to grow. And then with our closure in 2013 and our expansion, which opened in 2016, and now we have a staff of more than 400 people. So the museum has really, really changed a lot. But I regard myself as uh, having an extremely privileged role in working on maintaining and preserving collection. So what does a paintings conservator do? You might think, oh, the Sistine Chapel, the Mona Lisa, here's a work of art that maybe has, uh, someone's fallen into it, it's been vandalized, it's degrading over time. And I come from a background where I worked at institutions where I was primarily doing uh, treatments of old mistresses and old master paintings. My background includes working at the National Gallery of Art, and I'll get into my training in professional traje trajectory during the course of this talk. But I start with this image of our, our contract paintings conservator, Alina Ramba, working on a work from the University Art Museum Berkeley by Hans Hoffman. And when I started at SF MoMA, we acted more as a regional center because we had a conservation studio. We could take in works from private collectors and um, other museums in the area that didn't have the resources to take care of their own collections. It's really changed now in that we don't act as a regional center so much. And in the course of my third, almost third years at the museum, the discipline of modern and contemporary uh, conservation has really come to the forefront before modern and contemporary. I mean, the paintings are, the artworks are new. What's wrong with them? Well, the challenge of working with a modern and contemporary collection is that artists use a variety of materials. They're challenging the media. And so what are you going to do when something is incompatible, has an inherent bias problem? So I'll be telling you more about how we work with living artists, and that's really one of the joys of working at SF Moment, because when I worked at collections at places like the National Gallery, I always wished that, oh, I wish this painting could talk to me. Why is this problem happening? What happened 300 years ago with this petition? Who intervened, and what did they do? have the materials and techniques to analyze and try and answer that question, but with SF MoMA's modern and contemporary collection, we can go directly to the artists themselves. So here you see my colleague who's actually doing some damage repair on a Hoffman painting, but that's almost, the treatment aspect is just one small part of what I do. I'll show you a picture of our new conservation studios, which we redesigned and we're um, part of the expansion building when we opened in 2016. We have studios that are on two floors, and you can see we have amazing window and natural light. The trunks are what we use um, to uh, evacuate toxic solvents if we're working on something that is a health risk. People always ask about those elephant trunks. But you see in the center of the three images here. This is our artist materials tower. And when we redesigned our studio in the uh, new building, we really wanted to incorporate the great collection we have of artist materials that we have uh, amassed over time. So on this tower, we can store and display artist materials. 
Here's a bit of the Solowit Loopy Doopy materials that are in our main atrium. We have materials by uh, Eva Hesse and her plastic and rubberware. This is a whole selection of Robert Rauschenberg mock-ups that we did of his glossy black painting, which is currently on view. And I don't know if, I hope all of you have been to SF MoMA. If you haven't been, I hope you can go soon and see some of the real materials, the glossy black painting um, by Rauschenberg. Oops. It's currently on display, and I've done a lot of work on that. And maybe during the q and I can tell you a bit more about it. So as a paintings conservator, I work with um, maintenance and gallery checking. We do a lot of dusting and just reviewing all the artworks before you, the door opens at 10 and people come in. I work with a huge team of the other uh, departments in the museum. Installation, uh, those are the people who put works up on the wall and move them around. Registration, they track everything and with a collection as big as ours. Objects are coming and going all the time. We have to know where they are and how to get them to a place that if you're going out on loan. I work with curators. You'll hear from one of our curators today. I work with the data people because we have, we're always entering work into our database. Education, I'm here today to uh, try and educate you about what I do. And then we also work with marketing and development for special tours and fundraising to get the word out. So, as part of our maintenance, we go around every morning, almost, or several times a week, and just make sure that all the exhibition works uh, on display are in good condition. On the left is our beautiful Mark Rothko painting, number 14 from 1961, and it has finger marks on it, because there was the worst case scenario of a runaway child getting past their parents or the, and the guards and touching this really fragile artwork. So here we have uh, one of our um, fellows looking at the area that was impacted by the finger marks very um, closely with a bright light. And then on the right-hand side is our team of uh, Rothko uh, conservators that worked on a different Rothko painting that had a big scratch on it. So the, the treatment process is, is quite exacting. There's a lot of documentation that we do before, during, and after treatment, just to make sure that for the record, everything we do is very, very well documented for the next generations of conservators who want to know, what did Paula do to that Rothko in 2019? Well, you've got the photos, you've got our written records. That's really important. On the left is half of the panel of our giant Osiris and Iris, Isis painting by Anselm Kiefer. You're looking at a painting that's lying on its longest side because it's too big to store and ship. Vertically. And again, this is just half the painting. Well, what's going on with this? This is one of the things that if it's not broken, do you have to fix it? We do preventive conservation. And in this case, the work is going to be transported to Europe for big Anselm Kiefer retrospective. I work with loans a lot. And with Kiefer, we normally wouldn't want to loan a painting that's this big, this fragile, and has already had some condition issues. Here we go. Uh, I don't know if you can see on the left, there's this sling. That's a piece of ceramic that fell off. And we wanted to honor Kiefer's desire to have this painting in his show. So we worked directly with him to ship it in its fragile condition and then work, work on it in Paris with his studio assistant. Whereas we used to be naysayers, no, it's too big, it's too fragile, it can't go. Now we really work to make these types of objects available and shipping something on its beak and as fragile as this is quite a, a long story. So ask me about it later. How did this Kiefer get to Paris? And then on the right hand side you have Rodney McMillian installing in this land in our new works show. This is a painting that Mr. McMillian did in Los Angeles. He rolled it up on a tube and then it had to be installed in the lower part in three sections around a curved wall. So we worked with Mr. McMillian to figure out how to get this painting, which isn't, this, which isn't on a typical strainer, on the wall. And uh, disciplines at SF MoMA include paintings, that's me, photography, objects, electronic media, and we all work together because things are often uh, cross-disciplinary. So here you have Amanda Hunter Johnson working on our uh, Robert Rauschenberg automobile tire print, and that's always a challenge for storage and display. It gets requested a lot for exhibitions, so we have to figure out how to get it on the wall. It used to be rolled up, now we just 
display it and install it in one long it's the entire section. On the right is uh, Martina Heidelgel working on a Nam June Pike. Don't ask me about electronic media conservation because I don't know how to do it, but this is an emerging field. There are very few people who do it. And just thinking ahead of if you're te technologically inclined and you like data, electronics, electronic media, there is now finally a, a, one of the conservation training programs that has electronic media as a discipline. Our objects conserver, Emily, Emily Hamilton, is hosing down the large Richard Serra sequence painting. This is at the Cantor Center, and it came to our museum for a couple of years. It's quartz steel, so it has to be moistened periodically, so the rust layer will continue to develop naturally. On the right is Roberta Piazzavilla, our photo conservator. And then I'll talk a bit about training programs. There are three <coughs> training programs in the United States. I went to the University of London Portal Institute, and um, I was glad to have the chance to live in London for three years, but the training programs are quite uh, demanding in their prerequisites. So if you're interested in becoming a conservator, do ask me more questions, and I'll tell you what the route is. But basically, to be a conservator, you need focus, you need good hand-eye coordination. As an undergraduate, you need good technical experience in the fields of chemistry, art history, and studio art. And I studied the art history and the studio art, not so much the chemistry, but I did go back to a school to get the chemistry requisites. And then most training programs require that you do pre-programmed experience in an institution or with a private conservator. So on the left is a woman that was a pre-programmed person trying to get experience just so that she knew that conservation was what she wanted to do. And then on the right is a, an advanced fellow in conservation. We have a, a, a two-year program where someone who's out of a program has some experience and wants to really hone in on contemporary art conservation. Comes and works with us in various disciplines uh, that our department can offer, but oftentimes it's very cross-disciplinary. And this the woman is sitting in an inflatable house designed by Alex Schwiebler. And every time the inflatable house was blown up, it would inflate it, it, would, it had air leaks, so they had to work with the artist to make the inflatable house stay inflated. Um, we work with so much with living artists, and in the past, um, we wouldn't really encourage artists to come and work on their pieces, but that has really changed. Here we have Mangechi Mutu. She's working on her ink and pigment painting on vellum, and the ink had poor adhesion problems. So she came in and actually addressed the damage instead of us doing it, and we were, learned a lot with these processes. Kamal Patton came in and worked on his graphite on unstretched paper. It fell off the wall because we didn't have an installation system to hang it safely. We tried magnets and they didn't work, so uh, he came in and helped us uh, uh, treat the work where it had, it had fallen on the floor and became crushed. And this is just a great opportunity for us to work with living artists, so we really try and do it as much as we can. We have technology, so although SF MoMA doesn't do a lot of uh, high-end analysis, we work with other uh, institutions that can do pigment or media analysis for us. And in this case, just a couple of weeks ago, before the fires, I was at the Getty Institute for a tear-mending canvas workshop. So here we are looking at apparatus on the left to hold a torn canvas painting in plain before repair. And then on the right is just all the stuff that was on the table, the microscopes, the gadgets, the equipment that were used for this workshop of 10 people to try reweaving canvas. That was really fun. Here's something closer to home, the great uh, Diego Rivera, Pan American Unity Mural. We'll be bringing this to SF MoMA uh, next fall. Ask me how. <laughs> and then we had the great privilege of going to Mexico City and talking with the expert experts there who have removed and transported portable murals by Diego Rivera. Uh, this is Ruth Asawa's daughter, not Ruth Asawa herself, and uh, Ruth Asawa's son, Paul. They came and shared their mother's materials, sketchbooks, uh, techniques uh, with us in the studio. And then Wayne Tebow came recently and organized his own show of works that he collected. He's in his late 90s, and he ran us into the ground that day. But it was a wonderful experience of trying to keep up with Wayne. Our uh, current show, Soft Power, features a, a great strata of artists from all over the world 
I really encourage you to see this cutting edge show. And during the install, which uh, I didn't work on personally, but there was a lot of challenge with works that we didn't know what they were going to be, and the artists would show up. So Javier, Javeria Simmons is installing her 157 panel work on the left. I didn't want to really bug her, so I just took this candid shot of her from behind because and during the install it gets kind of tense. Um, and then uh, Iman Ori Yuron had a really big canvas work that was restretched by our staff. He's in the background, they're working on his computer. The Julie Moretu uh, giant uh, installation in the atrium was a real head scratch in terms of how to get these rolled works on those giant walls. Ask me how we did it. And that's Julie Moretu putting on the finishing touches. And then here's our team. Um, the conservation field up to date has been mostly women, pretty white, and I'm just hoping, and I know that the training programs and other opportunities for conservators are really growing in terms of Native Americans, people of color, really uh, opening the door to this field and making it much more diverse with a group of people who, from their cultures, can work with their historic artifacts, artifacts and legacy. I put my email up on the top so you can contact me if you have more questions later after the Q&A. Um, I have much more to say, but I hope that will come out during our discussion. Thank you so much. Art or becoming a curator of contemporary art. 
the doctorate isn't as necessary, just to put that out there, but you know, you can ask me more about that. Um, for the history of photography, since it's such a short field, about 170 years, um, most people, I, I'm a 19th centuryist, but I can do, uh, I can do contemporary as well, so I consider myself a generalist. Um, uh, but you do need to know about the history of art and how the medium of photography isn't isolated. It connects to all the art uh, that's happening around it, not just art, but design um, and cultural things that are happening. And so you need to be aware of that. Um, that took many years. Um, I think maybe 10 years of, you know, nine years for the doctorate, um, two years for the master's, and four years for the bachelor's. Um, and then I had to get a lot of practical experience. Um, I worked in photography studios, was a photographer's assistant, I'll get to that. So I know how a camera works. I wanted to be a photographer, my pictures weren't very good, but I was really interested in the reading about them. And so that's kind of how I ended up a little bit on my track. Um, I was an intern at a gallery and I had museum experience. Um, but you also need to know um, or at least be willing to public speak or know how to public speak, but that's a skill that can be worked on. Um, so it's not something you have to be good at right away. I, it was actually my worst quality um, when I first started, uh, but I think it become a little bit better. Um, I think, let's see, you need to be able to write. Uh, and that's also a skill that can be honed um, because writing, people edit you and you learn from that. So, you know, I've become a better writer over the past 10, 15 years. Um, and you need to be able to talk to people, talk to artists, talk to donors, um, and support them and support the artists and figure out kind of what their intention is. So it's about being able to um, have empathy with the artists. And so you need to be able to do that as well. My trajectory. So I am a San Francisco native. Um, I grew up about seven minutes from here, uh, from City College, uh, over by Tower Market, if any, or, but it's now not Tower Market, I think it's Holly Stones. Um, so it's a basic Twin Peaks. Um, I even took a class at City College while I was in high school here. I think I took an Italian course um, in the marina uh, at night. Um, after uh, graduating from high school, Oh, actually, let me just say, um, so I grew up in San Francisco. My mom was a single mom. Um, I was also the first person in my family to go to college um, and first born um, in America. My father was born and raised in Brazil, and my mother was born in a displaced persons camp in Germany after the war. Um, so just so you understand my background. Um, I got a full scholarship to the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and went there for my bachelor's degree. I didn't know what I wanted to study. I ended up studying communications with a focus in fine art. It wasn't until my last year that I started taking photography courses and became really interested in the medium. I really liked um, the critiques and talking about photography, which probably should have signaled something for me, but it wasn't necessarily me making the work, but it was about talking about the work and seeing how the photographs um, made uh, kind of made dialogues with each other on the walls. So after I earned my bachelor's degree, I moved back to San Francisco and went, uh, I worked as a photographer's assistant um, in various food photography studios. So with view cameras and, um, and at night um, or on random days, I would take classes at City College. I think I took a large format class, a lighting class, um, and I took that history of photography class that I mentioned just at the beginning of my talk. Um, it was, it was so much, the, the content of that history of photography course like sparked such great interest for me that like no class at UPenn ever did. It was amazing. Um, I was so invested in every lecture, in every reading, and um, from that point on, I realized that's probably what I should be doing. Um, and so I, once I realized that I really liked history of photography, I learned, I thought that maybe I better take some history of, uh, I should take some history of art courses and think about graduate school. So I worked at a food photography studio. Uh, I managed it so that um, at night I would take classes at SF State in the afternoons. Um, I also got um, a one or two day internship at the Franklin Gallery, which maybe you guys are aware of um, back in the day. Uh, 
for my application uh, and I wanted to see, you know, if I actually like working in galleries, but it wasn't, it wasn't maybe for me, but it was really helpful to like get to touch the works and, um, and be a part of that experience. I then ended up going to the University of Arizona. I applied to a lot of different programs and I actually went to who funded me. Um, and so I didn't want to get into debt by going into an expensive master's program. Um, I, um, I got into NYU, I got into a lot of different places, um, but the University of Arizona paid my way. And so I went there and it was amazing. They had um, a huge archive of photographs by Ansel Adams, Harry Callahan, Aaron Siskind. Um, and it was a wonderful place to learn more um, about history of photography. And I, while I was there, I um, had an internship also at the Center for Creative Photography, where I was able to um, work with the curators there and um, really gain a lot of hands-on experience about um, how to be a curator. Um, I was even given the opportunity to do a permanent collection show my last semester there, and um, that was wonderful. And while in my last semester, I also applied for doctoral programs. Um, so then I went on to Rutgers, um, where I would end up getting my PhD. Uh, during that time, I um, wanted to also have the practical experience of being in a museum. And so I asked for an informational interview uh, in the photography department at the Met. Um, and they said, they, they considered it, they said, okay, we're, will we're, we're willing to give you um, an internship, but, uh, but we wanna give you an internship in something that you're not, it, that's not your area of expertise. And so for my master's, I focused on contemporary photography for my internship, they had me catalog a large group of 19th century photographs, something that I wasn't, I had no, I knew nothing about it, but they were like, you need to be learning in an internship. That's the only way we're gonna do this. So I did it one day a week for a year. Um, and it and them allowing me into this family at the Met um, allowed me to get uh, a, so that's, that, those are the kind of things that I cataloged. So figured out dates, artists, whatnot. It allowed me to get a research assistant position at the Met um, uh, for the show Faking It, Manipulated Photography Before Photoshop. Um, and so I then got a paid part-time position while I was working on my doctorate, um, which helped my CV, my resume. Um, and I got to, it was a traveling exhibition. Um, I got to work um, on a catalog. It was, it was a really amazing experience. And so, but it took, you know, it took perseverance and, and luck, really, um, to get that. I happened to be at, there at the right place in the right time, and there was a position available for a year and a half. Then, um, because I was part of that, again, I was there, um, I got to be the co-curator for After Photoshop, a contemporary photography show um, that was uh, the complementary or the epilogue, if you will, of faking it. Um, and so I, I got to suggest uh, photographers to, for the Metropolitan to acquire for this show. Um, and that was, it felt, it was very empowering. I was also given um, three different Johnson rotation galleries um, during my time at the Met because I was also, they also funded uh, my dissertation, I should say. So after faking it and after Photoshop, um, I applied for a fellowship, um, a dissertation fellowship at the Metropolitan, and they uh, gave it to me. Um, I got it, I had a renewal as well. So um, they funded pretty much my, the writing of my dissertation. And during that, I got to do these Johnson Gallery rotations where um, I had to tell the history of photography from their collection. Um, and I think, yeah, it was in showing different places, different processes, um, and it was a wonderful experience. And without that, I wouldn't have been able to get my position at SFMOMA. Um, I needed that experience of um, of being in charge of a, of a small gallery space. Could I, could I put up a rotation from the permanent collection? Um, could I handle the stress of a big traveling exhibition like faking it uh, with a catalog and multiple living artists in, in after Photoshop? Because it's hard to speak with 20 uh, living artists and all of their desires of how they want it shown um, and all of, you know, the, everything that comes with that. Um, but yeah, I... I feel really lucky to have started here, though, at City College and 
Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, during the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Uh, I'm Sarah Murphy. I'm the Associate Director of Social Media and Content Marketing at SF Mama. And it's uh, just want to echo what my colleagues have said, that it's a huge honor for us to get to be here today. Um, really excited and appreciate your time and coming to listen and hear us talk about our careers at SF Mama and how we got here. So, uh, Here's me. That's me again, in case you're not sure. Um, my, I've been at SF Moment now for, it's coming up on uh, about a year, the new year in a few weeks. Um, that's my LinkedIn account. Please find me. Please connect with me if you have additional questions after this and want to talk about museums or about marketing and social media and content. Uh, I love talking about those things. My family will appreciate it. They won't have to hear about it as much. Uh, to the right is a photo that was taken of me during one of our uh, recent member events at SF MoMA, which um, I didn't realize a photo was being taken and I was taking a break from doing some social media and streaming the event to actually do screen printing, which ties in a little bit to my experience as somebody with a non-art background, getting to work in a museum and the continual joy and excitement that it brings to get to do things like screen printing at a party when I'm taking a break from the museum's Instagram account. So marketing and communications in general, but at SF MoMA, uh, really, you know, these are the, the, the serious definitions that I, you know, would list in my LinkedIn profile or if I was being very uh, formal about what marketing and communications end up meaning. But for me, and particularly with museum, but basically anywhere else I've ever worked, it's a lot about connecting with people. It's hearing from them. It's trying to meet them where they are and share with enthusiasm and with sincerity and authenticity, whoever you're representing, or in my case, whatever institution you're representing. Um, I am so fortunate that you heard the work from both of my colleagues here. There are so many other people and positions like that around the museum, and if only there was more time for me to be able to tell their stories uh, on the museum's social media accounts. I also manage the museum's um, email program, <laughs> newsletters. Uh, so there's no shortage of artist stories, behind the scenes museum stories, community events, things that our education team works on that my team gets to help share out um, with the larger audience of the Bay Area and then anybody around the world who's interested in the museum. Uh, day to day, so my job uh, title, which is very long, is again, Associate Director of Social Media and Content Marketing. I might have one of the longer titles in the museum for somebody who's not a curator that has a donor's name in their title. Um, but basically, it just means content. And content is anything from uh, an upcoming exhibition to an artist interview <laughs> to behind the scenes with our events team and figuring out the right way to distribute or publish that content so that it gets seen by the most number of people at the right time in a way that's relevant for them. Uh, the two channels that I work on are email and social media. And for social, the museum focuses primarily on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Um, I think there have been some experiments in things like Snapchat, and I heard somebody asking about us having a TikTok account the other day, but my plate's already a little full. Uh, and then with email, I've broken it out into two categories of the general public and then people who are members. And one of the reasons that we separate that out is members end up having different perks or first access to different events, or um, in some ways don't need the same introduction to what the museum is that we constantly need to stay humble with and sharing out to the general public, not assuming that people know what SF MoMA stands for, how long the museum is, when it's open, how much it costs to come. So thinking about ways to continually share that message or those messages in a way that's uh, not boring and ends up being useful is something that my team talks about a lot. Uh, yeah, so my, my days are uh, way more meeting heavy than I've had in previous positions. I've worked in other jobs where I spend a lot of time doing writing or content production. And at the museum, because it's now, I think, almost 500 people, um, really, my main focus is trying to connect with as many of my colleagues as possible in a timely manner so that I can learn in advance about their programs, 
what the team's goals are, if they have an event coming up that they really want additional help promotion, you know, with promoting, if an artist is going to be around and that artist is going to let us do a behind the scenes interview. Um, so a lot of planning, a lot of calendaring, I uh, use uh, as examples, Airtable and Asana, those are two project management tools that are free that I self-taught myself on that I use um, and have used in the past few jobs to manage the large number of content that ends up coming in. Um, goal setting is you know, really about thinking why we're communicating, what the larger strategic goal is. The museum recently went through an exercise of outlining a five-year strategic plan. So in addition to my job being trying to get people to come to the museum and experience it, the museum needs to keep the lights on. And so revenue and selling tickets is something that I have to constantly think about with my team. Um, but also, you know, is the communication that I'm putting out uh, relevant? Does it tie back to the museum's strategic plan? One of the core components of the museum's new strategic plan is, you know, being brave and bold in our communication. So even though the museum is, has this incredible long history, us not just relying on assumptions that people know or about, or that that's still relevant today, but it was you know, when I was a kid coming to the museum in the 80s. Uh, creativity is nice in marketing as well. We want to make sure that you know my team, there's a lot of personalities. I want them to be able to tell their stories about the museum in a way that matches the museum's voice, but also be able to showcase the personalities and creativity of my colleagues. Um, there's folks throughout the museum, whether they're on the insult team, on the accounting team, working you know, in custodial, they're all there and working at a nonprofit in San Francisco in 2019 because they care about art. There's generally a creative fuel or fire that's part of that or some um, larger commitment to art and to art communities that I wanna be able to showcase. Uh, and then measurement, so a lot of data, a lot of reporting, Everything from is you know the minutia of like how many times something gets retweeted, is that you know what we're looking at for this month? Do we need to have more engagement on our Instagram account? Setting um, setting those goals and sharing back with the rest of my team on how we're doing. Is our audience growing? Are people opening our emails? Are we getting sent to straight to spam? I have to constantly look at those metrics, and uh, that ties back into reporting. So sharing not just with uh, my boss, um, but with our partners across the institution. So they know, you know, hey, we've tried this one thing with an email about your program next month. Let's try to do something on Twitter and with a Facebook event and try to increase attendance. So the skills that are needed, uh, more so for my position right now at the museum, <laughs> uh, a lot of project management. And I never went through any formal training or project management courses. I still think about doing those on a pretty regular basis. I probably will. It's a skill set that you need to continually refresh as new tools become available. But the core components of being a strong project manager are huge parts of my job. Um, communication. I'm naturally really interested in listening to people and connecting with them and hearing their stories. Being able to think thought, you know, about how I'm communicating. Am I listening enough? Am I actively listening? Are, am, I, am I soliciting stories from people around the museum or programs around the museum that aren't necessarily the loudest or the shiniest? How can I increase my skills there and try to draw those stories out? Uh, data analysis, another area in which I'm um, mostly self-taught or just needed to learn how to report back, how to look at data. I, Thankfully, took a statistics class here or there when I was in college, and that's laid the groundwork, but I continually try to stay up to date on best practices, on what sort of metrics and measurement, uh, measurements are important for marketing. Uh, tact is a really big one at the museum. There's 500 distinct personalities, a lot of living artists who I want to be incredibly respectful to and appreciative of their time. Um, there's still never enough time or space in the museum's publishing schedule to share everything out on social media or email that we would want to be able to. So sometimes I have to have hard conversations with colleagues whose programs I personally love or who I respect very much and to say, to say no in a tactful way, but keep the relationship moving forward. Uh, and then a sense of humor is pretty crucial for me as an individual. I think it's not a requirement for anybody if that's not your communication style or speed, but it helps me get through longer days uh, and more challenging uh, lead up to exhibition openings. So a little bit more about content and what 
I, when I talk about success, um, you know, likes are nice to look at. Um, what does it mean for something to resonate with people? Is it resonating with our existing audience? Are we only talking to ourselves? How do we increase that? Those are questions that I think about a lot. Um, but I, I really think that some of these keywords here are important components to have at least most of, if not all of, when we're thinking about, really, this is like the kind of planning that goes into Instagram posts of things being authentic, timely, transparent, you know, we have everything from how visitors are engaging with artwork in the galleries to the bottom right-hand corner is JR, the artist, uh, from an artist interview. And uh, above that is a program that the education team did with the libraries that had a lot of events around San Francisco. So quickly on how I got here, I grew up in the East Bay. Um, I went to Laney College, which is in Oakland, and it's part of the Peralta Community College District. Um, I started going there in high school and taking photography classes, and then was a history student there before transferring after doing my two years of undergrad at Laney uh, and transferring to UC Berkeley. So my background, as I mentioned earlier very briefly, is not in art. I was a history student who, after growing up in the Bay Area and being a Filipino American, second generation, but one of the first people in my family to graduate from college, as I was looking through Berkeley's archives and trying to decide what I wanted to do my thesis on, I was looking through different labor movement pieces of uh, archival material and started noticing a lot of people who looked like my uncles involved with um, some of the grape strike uh, movements in the 60s and ended up doing my thesis on the coalition building between Mexican and Filipino farm workers and, you know, looking at ways that class and labor intersect. Um, this is a very roundabout way of saying that after that, uh, I could not decide and didn't have the money to go to graduate school for history or law school for labor, which I was thinking about, and ended up working in the private sector because I needed to get a job. So I worked at a startup called Keen, which makes some of the ugliest and most comfortable <laughs> footwear you will ever see if you haven't already seen them before. Uh, they were a startup at the time in customer service. I moved from that into doing public relations at an agency, went from there to a phone company, back to the public relations firm and did social media. And then about a year ago, uh, SF Women was hiring for a position that had a weird amalgamation of almost all of the job skills I'd acquired in the last 14 years, and I took a long shot and applied. Uh, I'll kind of skip through this a little bit and just say, since I know we're coming up on time, these are some of the, the things that I've done in my career throughout the years, but how does somebody with a non-art background end up working at one of the like beautiful, most beautiful, largest, coolest museums in the country? Um, it comes from being very fortunate to have had a family that invested in art exposure when I was growing up, and that took my younger brother and I to galleries, to museums, to local art openings, um, so that even though I don't have a background in art, when I showed up at the museum, my passion, enthusiasm, and like strong enough understanding of art history was a good foot in the door, in addition to having done all the like nitty-gritty marketing things that I've listed out here. Um, that's everything from, that's like a little messed up, but like uh, working on photo shoots, you know, at previous jobs to um, creating content that can be shared out uh, on social media or in catalogs, working at trade shows, doing media events and someone in public relations, but getting to focus now on content and um, on showcasing art in a time when, as Arya was saying, uh, culture is continually under attack and being able to democratize access to art through social media is something that's really meaningful to me. Uh, and yeah, working at SF Bowman can be summed up for me in these two photos. Uh, it's a wild ride and it's a little bit of a blur. And I'm happy to talk more about that if you're interested. Thanks so much. All right, let's give a hearty round of applause for our panelists. All right, thank you so much, panelists. Um, beautiful, just wonderful. I really appreciated the spectrum and the sincerity. That was really wonderful. Um, a couple of things that I've observed is from what they were their experiences, because a lot of times it's the facilitator's job to kind of like recap or do the too long didn't listen you know, type shenanigans is perseverance, right? Perseverance, believing in yourself, 
right? A little bit of luck. Not taking no for an answer, right? And continuing to believe in the crap. And I think that's really powerful. And then also to see that the community colleges really played a really big role in all three of your careers. And again, I'm just, as the classified staff here, I'm just continuously impressed and humbled by the impact that this community college has had, not only in the Bay Area, but around the world. Um, and I think sometimes community colleges get a bad rap for that. So don't forget, you are in a very amazing institute that other amazing institutions want to come and play with, right? Okay, so for those of you who kind of came in late, there are no cards on your seats. Did everybody have a no card? Did anybody not have a no card? Raise your hand if you're not gonna no card. This is important. Okay, wonderful. Wonderful. What you're gonna do now is, for those of you who are kind of late, we're gonna take a we're gonna say 15 minute break and we're gonna come back at 11:10. For those of you who wrote down questions on your no cards, please pass your no cards to the inside, right? So we're gonna collect those questions and then we're gonna sift through them and look for themes and ask the questions from those cards. If you didn't get a chance to write questions because you came in late on those note cards, take some time now, write down your questions, one or two. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's that time to put away your phones and come back into the real life. That's right, put down those phones. Come back into the real life and ask some questions of these wonderful wonderfuls. I know we came back a little late, that's my bad. I always try to run a tight ship, but y'all asked some really great questions and I had some really hard time thinking of which ones I kind of represented a lot of them. So uh, if your specific question does not get asked, you can come and beat me up in the parking lot later. It's, it's not my fault. Okay, okay. Um, but I did try my best to kind of book it these wonderful questions that y'all asked. I really appreciate a lot of the critical thinking that went involved. Um, and Shana, you gotta know, like, Shana and Paula, y'all had so many, like, when you were like, ask me how to do this, they literally asked. <laughs> so get ready to answer those questions, okay? Because you talked a lot about artwork and how it moved, and so we're gonna ask those questions. Okay. So some of these questions are very broad and esoteric and philosophical right, because that's what we do as artists, and some are very specific, and some um, are pretty badass, I gotta say. So I'm really impressed with audience participation, so mad props to everybody out here. Okay, <clears throat> um, I'm just curious, the question here, and this was directed to one panelist, but I wanna kinda open it up to everybody. Uh, how do you feel your career is important to adding social value to society? I told you. I <laughs> here to college. Oh, I, I really like that question. And I think that with regard to conservation and working in a museum, art really matters. I love my career because I love art and I'm engaged with it. And I think that without art, where would we be? And it reaches all levels, uh, all aspects of society. And I think as the museum at least, really changes and enhances its programs to a more a diverse community. I think that's a great step and I think it will just improve. So without art, where would we be? Um, so I think uh, for me, art, art is everything. And um, when I am thinking about an exhibition, um, my, my initial uh, the thing that goes through my head is, so what's happening, how does this relate to what's happening today? How does this relate to contemporary experience? Whether I'm putting something from the 19th century on the wall, early 20th century, or uh, 21st century, even like, how does it relate to the issues of today? And I think that, for me, art is, is a way to engage with topics, topics um, that are pressing on our, on our culture. It's a way to, um, it's a way to start a conversation. It's a way to, to, um, to get to the heart at how we're feeling, um, to maybe get the temperature or the climate of the day. And so as a curator, I feel like it's my job um, to try to find those threads running through art that are, 
hitting on topics of whether it's gender, race, uh, social equality, um, and um, and because I want our viewers to be engaged in what's happening, and I think the only way to really have that engagement is to um, to look at what's happening in our world. Uh, and that's something I actually have, uh, I think about a lot, because I think social media can be pretty poisonous and pretty awful, and as somebody who works in it for a living, uh, I'm constantly considering both those platforms as well as societal interaction with phones as opposed to people. So that's a question I ask myself pretty regularly. Um, one of the ways in which I hope it provides value uh, or resonates with people is in thinking about access points to art and thinking about the ways in which I was able to access art as somebody who grew up in a working class family in the East Bay with parents who were very passionate about art but who were not able to, you know, we didn't have a family membership to museums, um, so we took advantage of going when we could, a lot of free and public art, a lot of festivals that in that time in Oakland were very prevalent. Um, so I hope that through some of the more widely available access to some things in the museum's collection through its social media accounts, we're able to provide access to art more broadly. Um, and then something else I think about a lot is being able to tell stories of artists who are not necessarily typically represented either on the walls of the museum or in sort of um, traditional historical teachings of what Western art is considered valuable. And being able to test myself and be very humble about seeking out those stories and asking for other perspectives and using my position as an opportunity to uplift and broaden the reach. Wonderful, thank you panelists. So panelists, I want you for the next question, if you may humor me, close your eyes and imagine your 18 year old self. Okay, what is this person like? What are their fears and anxieties about getting a job? Because that's real. Now, I want you to think about if you could go back in time and give this person one piece of advice, what would that piece of advice be? I was, I was telling someone during the break that between my undergraduate um, education and getting into a graduate program in conservation, I worked at a really horrible job for a year. And that was a great experience because it sure taught me what I didn't want to do and to be very adamant about getting together what I needed to, get, to do to get into a program. So take that crappy job and run with it. <laughs> we'll run out of it. <laughs> um, so there are two things I would tell myself. Um, one, it would be just apply already. So um, I, you can't get into a program or get a scholarship or get funding or get the job if you don't actually apply. Um, and I think there were probably two or three years where I was just taking classes at SS State and City College. I was taking all these classes, but I probably had enough credits by that time to have applied to graduate school. But I was so careful. I, was, I thought that this would be my one and only shot. Um, but I think in retrospect, what was I waiting for? I was so worried to fail that I, I feel like it could have happened even sooner. Um, and secondly, um, I was, at one point, I had wanted to take a, a photography class in high school, and I was, again, scared that I wasn't gonna be good at it, and so I didn't take it in high school, but I had always been so curious about photography, and it wasn't until my senior year of college that I finally got up the courage to take this photography class, and it was like mind-blowing. So maybe if you're scared to take a class, it's probably a sign that you should take it. Um, take it then, okay. Uh, mine was, I was pretty angry when I was 18. I'll start with that. <laughs> and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and it felt like there were very rigid ways to get the places that I thought I wanted to go. 
sort of along the lines of what you were saying of, of applying, I think I would have told myself, like, imposter syndrome is very real, but it does not need to determine the choices that I make. Like, that voice still lives in me when I'm in the museum, and I'm marveling at how, you know, I get to walk, like, behind the galleries and come out through the side doors. But there are artist names that get said pretty regularly that I don't know who that person is, you know, uh, and that's okay. And like those feelings don't need to determine the decisions that I make or the risks that I take. Awesome, thank you panelists. So if I may do the recap. Every experience prepares you for the next experience. Take positive risks. Everything you want lays on the other side of your fears. And it's okay to not know every single artist that everybody's talking about. And your feelings don't make it real. Just because you feel a certain way does not make it a reality. Was that, was that pretty accurate? Yeah, that was it. Okay, very important. Okay, panelists, I know you briefly touched upon this during your spiels. Can you please just review, because I just there were tons of questions regarding this. You know, what specific feedback or advice would you give around the role of education, specific technical trainings, you know, so thinking about AAs, bachelors, master's degrees, let me go pay Stanford however many thousands of dollars to do this training, you know, how valuable and effective in reflecting your own experiences was that in finding your career, in getting to your career, and then also in current day? And you all don't have to go in the same order. That was, uh, please, where was taken? Um, so I'd actually like to answer this. Um, if you're thinking about working in a museum, you're not going to be paid a ton of money. So, and I knew that. I had been aware of that um, before going in uh, to graduate school. And so I was very mindful about who gave me money for graduate school and who didn't. Um, I did not want to go to a forty thousand dollar a year program. And get, you know, 160,000. I just, I, I was very mindful, so please, like, think about that. Um, the education part is the most important, getting the degree, not necessarily where it's from. Um, and the other thing about um, programs and education, it's also the connection you make with the professor. It's not just the classes that you take, but the, like, go to the office hours and like get to know somebody, because you're also going to need letters of reference. Those are really important, not just uh, the box that says you got a B plus or an A minus or an A. It's can a professor actually write about you in a way that's real um, for those applications. And I wanted to mention that it's a long road, road to home to get into a conservation career via the typical means of the uh, post or the graduate training programs, but you can get creative about working maybe with a private conservation studio and getting pre-programmed experience. You can, uh, some people are self-trained and then they get experience along the way, eventually by either working in an institution or setting up their own private business. There's a group called the American Institute of Conservation that has a whole lot of information on conservation careers and I think you just have to be persistent and know that this is what you want to do and love art and then just keep trying. And then financially, I don't know really what to say about that because my education, the formal part, was so long ago. But I think there are options to work with granting agencies and work study uh, in all situations. And I hope that's still the case. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh... Graduate school was something that I really wanted to do, but that I was pretty sure was not going to result. I was very interested in studying history, and I was not interested in becoming a tenured history professor or trying to go along that path. I still think sometimes about going back to graduate school. It calls to me. Um, but uh, because I went to Laney and then transferred to UC Berkeley and applied and got a scholarship through my dad's union, my dad was a sheet metal worker. I was able to graduate college with very little debt. And that meant, um, that's something that I don't know is as applicable today, and I'm, you know, I want to say that with a lot of reverence and respect. Um, but it informed uh, me deciding to not pursue further schooling, even though I, you know, 
I love spending time in the, li the library and archives at UC Berkeley. I would still like to go do that. I might still someday. Um, I do think that uh, I didn't get a chance to talk about the industry I was in before I worked in museums, but it was the outdoor industry, sort of like outdoor companies and camping companies and a lot of environmental nonprofits. Um, schooling is important. Uh, what I look for when I'm looking at resumes is somehow someone's interest coming through. It doesn't have to be in a school program. It could be in volunteering, which I know is additional like unpaid labor that requires time. Um, I, I mean, I think graduate school for, for marketing and for communications, people do that route. I don't think it's as applicable. Work experience matters. And I know that getting your foot in the door to get that work experience for me was a lot of times half the battle. And it took uh, taking a lot of entry-level customer service positions that I didn't really want to do or that I was very nervous about doing that eventually led to the positions that I'm in now. Wonderful. Thank you, panelists. So, uh, too long didn't listen. Uh, I heard correctly, so please correct me if I, I didn't, is you need to be very tactful about if you decide to pursue education, doing it in a way that's going to serve you and not going to drown you in debt, there are other ways to acquire experience and demonstrate your passion for this. And remember, saying you're passionate about something doesn't make you passionate about it, right? It's like nerding out, right? Um, putting energy into the people who want to build with you, right? So, uh, Dr. Lopes, doctor, they're doctor, yeah, just making sure. Got respect, respect the doctors, they work hard. Um, you know, getting your in, investing in the people who want to build with you, right? So your instructors are going to write letters of rec for you. So be nice to them, engage with them, learn about them, right? They're here to, to help you build. And I know if anything about team art, they're definitely, definitely into that. Um, and then also be creative about how you present yourself in application materials, right? So you may not have exactly the degree from UC Berkeley, right, or you know NYU, but maybe you started your own little personal gallery in your garage and you bring the community in. That stuff's really cool and really interesting. And if there's anything I know about us creatives, we like really cool and really interesting, right? Um, and then of course I want to definitely honor uh, what Sarah was saying about um, like the thirst for knowledge and curiosity that we have as creatives is always going to be embedded in what we do. Um, and remember that that's always going to be available to you, and you don't have to pay a billion dollars to quench that thirst. Have you anything? Okay, and also there's grants and funding that can help you do things as well. Okay. Um, I would love to, panelists, if you could please share with the audience, studio audience, um, Let's go with two things, two things you want to see in a internship or job application in your world, if you get a chance to look at that and make a hiring decision. So two things you want to see in a resume or cover letter when you're looking at making hiring decisions in your world. I'm happy to go first with that. I, um, I'm fortunate enough at the museum to be able to volunteer to be on hiring panels for other departments and other teams. There's a lot of consensus driven decision making at the museum, so I get to weigh in on the web team's hiring and the design team's hiring. Um, something that uh, I wish I had known earlier on when I was applying for jobs and that I know now after having been involved a lot more in hiring is please ensure that on your resume, and I tell myself this if I ever apply anywhere else, uh, please ensure that the keywords in the job description are in your resume and in your cover letter. And unfortunately, that is something that I think in people's excitement to be first or apply right away or write something really long that demonstrates a lot of enthusiasm, there can be a, uh, a lapse. Does everybody know what a keyword is when Sarah says that? And I can give an example. Please do. So an example would be, I very recently um, hired a fantastic Bay Area born and raised email marketing manager. His entire job is managing our email marketing. <coughs> I think I went through about 100 resumes and maybe only 20 of them used the word email in the resume or in the uh, 
cover letter, and that's this is not me shaming or slighting that. I think that those folks were qualified in lots of other ways, but I had to find someone who knew about email and who could talk about email in either or both their resume or cover letter. <laughs> I went, through, I went through all of them. She reviews all of them. She is, there is no applicant tracking system at SFOMA. That's a big hit for y'all. Thank you. Um, so we recently hired a curatorial assistant in our department, and I was on the panel. Um, one of the most important things for me, at least in the curatorial realm, is I look for a cover letter that doesn't have grammatical mistakes. Or that, that or there's no spellings, or that someone has actually taken time to craft an, a well-worded, articulate letter. And um, and I should just be very honest. When I write a cover letter, I have two people look at it. Okay, like this is not something I do by myself. Um, I think it's really important to know that everyone has an editor. Um, so get someone else to read your letter um, and make sure that it makes sense. Um, and that, you know, there's nothing that sounds clunky or baggy, you know, like, um, I like 16 senses, you know, things like that. Um, and the second thing I look for is not a three-page long um, cover letter. Um, if you're applying for an academic position, that's a very different story. Um, but for a museum, a page, a page and a half, for at least for uh, curatorial, is sufficient. Um, the CV, the resume, can be long, but the cover letter doesn't need to be pages and pages long. I know with our hiring of our advanced fellow, um, I always, we always look for people who are intellectually curious, and I'm always very keen to find out if they know the collection at all. Have they done their homework? You want to work at SFMOMA? What's your favorite painting or your artist? Or who do you really like or don't like? Do some homework for the institution or the entity that you're applying for so that they know that you took the time to really engage with what that potential employer is offering. I love it. Thank you so much, panelists. So for too long, didn't listen. Keywords. You're applying for a job that has email marketing manager in it? What words should be on your resume and cover letter? Email, marketing, and manager, uh, amongst others that are in the job description. That's super important. Um, when you are putting together your assets, proofread, no grammar, no spelling mistakes. And yes, I will be real, writing resumes and cover letters is soul crushing. And that's the system that we're working with right now, so take the time, proofread it yourself, not immediately after you wrote it, because your brain is dead at that point. Then proofread it later, share it with someone else to proofread it. You want to send it to me, I'm an employment person, I will proofread it, right? And then you will cry because I will tear it apart. And then share it to another person to proofread it, and then apply. And then lastly, and I love this because y'all you, you are just confirming everything I tell the students, is like, do your homework. <laughs> Right? You want to work in a place? Why do you love this place? Talk about the MoMA. Talk about the Institute. Talk about that time you went in there and you had your mind blown by those floating bowls in that one room and it was so peaceful that you almost felt like you saw liberation. Right? <laughs> I don't even remember what that was called, but I really enjoyed that. It's like you have to nerd out in your assets a little bit. Was that everything, Pamela? Thank you. So, um, in my world, as a career person, I've observed that hiring is arbitrary and sometimes discriminatory, right? And it's real. And some of the members of the studio audience are looking at their second careers and they want to kind of get a sense of, for those who might be on the later end of their career life or on their second career, are there opportunities for you know people who are maybe in the 50, 60 plus crowd? Can we please speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I can say that uh, that's something that I was delighted to see with our last summer internship group, that there was a variety, that diversity wasn't just represented through ethnicity, that there were students uh, who were interns at a variety of age levels, and I thought that that was important to me that the museum did not equate internship with age 22. 
Um, and I would definitely say, you know, I've met folks at a variety of points in their uh, careers who are starting for the first time at SF MoMA, whether it's frontline staff working at the ticket area to interns, as I mentioned, to um, folks who apply to work on our fundraising and events team. I'm not going to pretend that ageism isn't real um, or legal, but um, or something that everybody will have to consider if they're not already considering, but I have been impressed to see that that is something the museum appears to be actively um, trying to address. As a legacy staff member, I get really excited when I see someone new who's maybe over 30. And uh, since I've been in the same position for so many years, I don't know quite how to address how, say, in conservation, whether we would be able to accommodate somebody who was looking for a second career in conservation who was perhaps more mature. But there are always opportunities, and we don't really have an active volunteer program at this point, but it's something that we used to have, and it would be certainly um, something we could consider bringing back. And certainly with the other museum um, programs, like the summer interns and the frontline staff and such, I think there are more and more possibilities for uh, non-entering people, but people who are considering a second and third career later on in their professional lives. For me, if someone can write and talk about photography, I don't care how old they are. Wonderful. So, uh, kind of like the too long, didn't listen, is at SF MoMA, if you can communicate why you are a fit and you have something interesting and exciting to say, it doesn't matter if you're one or 100. They won't, they'll want to talk to you. I mean, if you're a one-year-old and you're applying, that's impressive nonetheless. Um, but I'm, re I'm really pleased to hear that, y'all. I'm really pleased to hear that. Okay, the next question, <clears throat> I'm just going to read it straight from this card. As the MoMA is being asked to dis disclose its funding and investments from private prisons, how can SF MoMA be a leader in working with communities to be more transparent about the sources of funding and investment? Sarah Murphy. Yeah, so as the resident person on the communications staff, um, marketing and communication staff, I'm happy to try to address this very important, very timely question about funding and about um, donor affiliations. Um, I'm going to have to warn you, my answer is going to be a little bit of a non-answer because that's not an area that I work actively in, but I can say that it is something that our fundraising and donor management team is taking very seriously. Um, that people are interested in increased transparency and understanding of donor affiliation and how the museum solicits money and from whom. Um, so aside from saying that I know that people are talking about it and taking it seriously and taking concerns about that seriously, that's about the limit of my knowledge on that, but it is a conversation that is not just in the news, but is happening internally as well. Wonderful. So it sounds like I said MoMA's pretty woke, y'all. They're doing their best. I mean, this I think this stuff is really challenging and complex, and it can be triggering for a lot of people. And as humans, sometimes it's really hard to just have like a decent dialogue about how do we undo this thing that has been going for so long, right? You know, and, and money is a thing, and you know, it's it's really challenging. So I really appreciate you, you know, just taking that question on, you know. Um, kind of like a semi-lighter follow-up to that question. And if the person in the room who asked this question is here, I, will, I just want to get some unpacking of some of this language. Uh, the question reads, what is the SF MoMA actively doing to democratize its mission and provide more accessibility? Is the person here who wrote this question? Yeah. Oh, you got, you got to do a question. Oh, my God, you tricked me. <laughs> um, yeah, can, so I, I, I just want to, just, can you just unpack the terms democratize, and what do you mean by accessibility? So clarity for the panelists, please. Um, well, should I stand? No, you can stand right there. I'm quite happy with standing. I'm not shy. Um, it really, in terms, I'm taking a course in Intro to Museum Studies here at City College, and we're looking at, you know, democratizing in terms of accessibility for 
you know, peoples in marginalized communities, for example, you know, the museum is not free. So, you know, accessibility in terms of opening up to marginalized communities, trying act actively engaging with communities. Do you, you know, go into those communities? Um, and also, how about like actively, you know, like bringing those communities into the museum to work in the museum? What opportunities are there for marginalized community people in marginalized communities? And I'm referring particularly because, you know, in the, in San Francisco alone, um, you know, there are so many people who do not. I go to the MoMA and I don't see the community where I live represented necessarily at the museum, except for maybe the security guards. So, um, you know, that's what I'm referring to. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So if I'm hearing you correctly, and this is something that's probably very broad for a lot of different organizations and institutions across the Bay Area. Tell us about some of the things that SF MoMA is doing to do outreach and bring people from, you know, people who don't have access to the MoMA to the MoMA. Yeah, so that's a great question. It's something that um, I'm fortunate enough in my job to be able to do a lot of uh, working with other teams who are focused on that and who have different outreach perspectives. So we have everything from our education team who does a lot of programming with either um, local elementary, middle, high school education to secondary education, not just focusing on private art universities, but being in places like City College, having relationships with um, schools in different parts of the Bay Area and trying to build coalitions there. Um, specifically as it relates to uh, pricing and thinking about access in that way. One of the things that I've been really um, happy to see at the museum is there isn't, there are not conversations about marginalized groups as a singular block. There's a lot of discussions about different barriers to access, whether it's transportation, whether it's pricing, whether it's people's work schedules, and you know, that not aligning with the museum's open hours. Um, I know that that's something that in the strategic plan for the museum, which I unfortunately can't quote directly verbatim, but is, is on the website, there is a strong component in that about increasing the number of free days that the museum offers. Um, through pretty generous funding, the museum is free to anybody 18 and under. So something I get to do in my job is promote that and really make sure that, I didn't know that, and I live here, um, so making sure that that message gets out. Um, and I think listening is a big part of that, uh, in addition to data that the museum can take a look at as far as who's coming to the museum, you know, what different categories they represent, whether it's socioeconomic, gender, you know, ethnicity, um, thinking about whether or not the collection is relevant to populations that the museum wants to try to attract more of or serve in better ways, those conversations are happening. So I think that there is no singular answer, unfortunately, to um, a very important question about that, but I can say that each individual team or department within the museum has either already been tasked or is, is continuing their work along those lines in democratizing access um, and making the museum feel more welcoming, be more welcoming, continue to be relevant to people that it has been relevant for, become more relevant to people that have not been interested in the past, uh, and then it's also listening, you know, it's good for me to hear that to be able to take that back and share that that's something that people are, it's not just us in our meeting rooms having conversations about that, but it is something that people care about and are willing to bring up at the end. question. Thank you for asking that. That's something that, um, so during the last free day that the museum had, um, staff were encouraged, if we were able or interested uh, in doing so, to volunteer to be ambassadors in the galleries. And one of the things that was the most rewarding for me about being able to do that was to hear feedback directly from folks who were seniors, students, and artists about previous membership levels that no longer exist. So the more that we hear feedback like that and are able to share it with folks, it matters. You know, it matters when I'm able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations or when that's able to be voiced here. 
I'm unfortunately not the person that's in charge of pricing, but I think that being able to share out needs and requests around that, it's pretty important for you know, me to be able to do that, so thank you for sharing it. I don't know the answer as to why those were taken away. I would imagine that there was an economic decision behind it that I'm not privy to. Oh, and, yeah. Oh, yeah, a few more comments. We used to have free Tuesday every month if, uh, up until 2013 when the building closed for the expansion. And I think free Tuesday didn't come back immediately because, again, maybe of the economics and they really wanted to bolster the mem membership. Free Tuesday was great. It was regular, first Tuesday of every month. It was a little bit of a concern because we got so many visitors that there were times when there were traffic jams traffic jams in front of the artwork, the guard and security staff were pressed, but um, I think it's a good idea. And I know they're having several community days now that are free per year. There's the half price on Thursday nights. But I do want to mention that we're developing, changing the subject a little bit, um, we're developing a tactile tour for people of no or low vision. And this is a pilot. We're going to roll it out in a couple of weeks. Where we'll, bring our artist materials into the galleries and we'll stand in front of, it's going to be the Rauschenberg glossy black painting, which um, we've done a lot of research on. We did a lot of mock-ups and we'll have all these mock-ups. We've been working with Lighthouse for the Blind and Blind Ambassadors and we're going to see how we can make the gallery collections more accessible to people with low or no vision and we're really excited to see how this will develop. I also used to have a student membership, and I, I agree. <laughs> um, but I did also want to say, um, for those of you who are taking art classes or art history classes, please, if, you're, if your professor um, hasn't maybe mentioned or talked about coming for a visit um, to SFM, but if photography or prints or drawings or uh, painting, um, you guys are learning about that, you can come and do a class visit. It's free. Um, we just have to figure out a time that works. Um, unfortunately, we can't really do evening classes, but um, but it's really amazing, um, and you get to come into the museum, and I think you get to go into the museum after, too. Yeah, but contact Jameson, he's the person. Um, but um, I know that Erica Gentry's class came, and other, like CCA has their uh, kids come. There's lots of different um, local uh, colleges that, that come to the study room, and I'd love to love to have you there. Awesome. Thank you so much, panelists. So as you can see, City College students don't play. Be very serious about this stuff. And also, I really want to acknowledge that what we're doing is unfolding a great deal of experiences that we've had leading up to this moment, right? And so whenever you have a running any kind of program or an institution, it takes a while to figure out like, okay, we have this idea, this is the vision, and that's wonderful, but how do we implement it, right? Just as, you know, you were talking about free Tuesdays caused traffic jams in front of the, you know, some of the paintings, and that was overwhelming for the guards. Um, so it takes a minute, and you know, one day when y'all are bosses and y'all are implementing programs and events and exhibits of your own, you know, you're gonna feel this same experience too. So I just wanna remember to share compassion, right? And um, I know personally as a member of staff here at City College, I have, I'm blessed enough to have a faculty pass, right? So we can hear that the strategies are coming and they're trickling out. And I'm just really pleased that y'all are even, that's even top of mind. That's wonderful. Okay, uh, we've got time for two more questions. My next question is kind of an interesting one. How do you get your own artwork accepted and displayed into museums? Not just the MoMA, but museums in general. Um, that's a, a, everyone goes about it in a very different way. Um, I guess for starting artists, um, for people who are trying to get their work out there, my main suggestion would be I would probably not spend money on those portfolio review uh, things that people do, where you pay like hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Those ones, those are not like I would. I would feel like, like my. I would want you to try to get into a group show, a local group show. All the curators, we go to all the shows, if we can, we try our best um, uh, in the area. And so we take note if we see, you know, if we see someone in a group show, don't, you know, it's not just monographic shows that we're interested in. Um, I think that's where you find some of the best people. We also talk to faculty um, at art schools or whatever, you know, if 
if someone tells me, hey, you know, I have this really interesting student, you maybe you should look at them, I'll do an artist studio visit. I, there's, um, there's different ways. I wouldn't spend a lot of money, um, I, I don't know, uh, with like uh, making like a book for yourself or, um, or even postcards. I would maybe get a website, a rudimentary website. Um, people don't drop off portfolios anymore at the museum. Um, uh, maybe send a single page letter um, to the head curator. You never know what's gonna happen. Um, but really like get yourself in a group show if you can. I think that's the best way to do it. SF Mamba does have um, several programs for emerging artists. One is called SICA, Society for the Encouragement of Contemporary Art. And as I speak, we are installing the latest SICA show that they run in every two years. So that should open, I think, this week. And those are artists who are not really mainstream, but they're local Bay Area artists. And there's a committee for SICA that goes around to all the artist studio uh, about six to 10 months before SICA is uh, installed. They select the artists that they want to present. There's also a new work show that is constantly rotating. And a recent new, new work show featured the works by a Lebanese artist who's about 90 years old, Etel Adnan. She's not a household name, but this was, again, thinking of ages, and we gave her a show, and um, that was really successful and got thrilling for all of us on the staff to show an artist uh, who was in her 90s and not well known like Wayne Tebow. That's wonderful. Um, so, the final question. And you know, you kind of touched on this a little bit. Is from my perspective, beauty is subjective, and thus art is a manifestation of beauty. And you know, there are gatekeepers to decide who gets shown what, where, right? What piece of advice would you give to the artists in the room about how to like manage the tension between? Oh damn, I want to create something that feels good to me and represents me, and also, it'd be cool to get it up on a wall. Does that, does that question make sense? Because I know I kind of asked something that's, that's really, it's a really big question. And as just museum practitioners and artists yourselves, I would just love to hear your insight and experience on it. You can ask clarifying questions about my question. I mean, I guess I would just say that any history of art is completely subjective, and there's so many different ways to tell the history of art, the history of photography, um, I tell a history of photography through SF Moma's collection, um, but each curator would tell a different story. Um, and so, yeah, uh, Claire, can you Claire, can you do it again? Yeah, just one piece of advice you'd give for aspiring content creators, you know, who are, who are just like, man, my stuff's subjective, it's hard to feel like I have an audience or anyone cares about my work, you know. Okay. Um, just something like that. So, um, I have actually um, been reading a bunch of, I'm a juror on something, not on one of those portfolio reviews, um, and I've been reading a lot of artist applications, and you can tell when an artist is really interested in a topic rather than they're throwing out all these like these jargon-esque words that I'm not sure they actually know what they're talking about. I, I'm not sure that that's what their interests are, and it's, it's being blinded by this language that's covering it up. And I feel like every every artist needs to kind of come up with a little bit of a bullet point, like or an elevator spiel. Like, what are you really interested in? What's like driving you? Give like two sentences, three sentences. If you can distill it in, in three like clear, not very long sentences, that's what you need. And that's what curators are also looking for. Like what are the issues that you're like that you're tackling? When it um, when I read an artist statement that's super duper long and just and it keeps going and going and I feel like and it's all over the place, I, I just I I want I just want to be in a room with them and say like just, just tell me like I'm nobody, tell me like I'm nobody, tell me like just give me a sentence and so try to try to figure out what your main interest is in the art. Why are you producing it? Is it because you're interested in like gender issues? Is it because you're um, you were born in a family, it's been displayed, like, what's, what's really driving it? And that, for me, is important. It's perfect, thank you. And maybe I'll counter that a bit with, well, what if your dream comes true and your artwork does come into the collection of SF MoMA? What if it's in our collection now and we don't show it? 
So a little anecdote, just last week, an art, local artist named Mary Lovelace O'Neill came to the museum. She's maybe in her 70s. She has an established art career. A work of hers from, I think it was 1972, was gifted to SF MoMA, and we had never shown it. Beautiful work on unstretched canvas. She put brown uh, powdered charcoal on it and vivid stripes of pastel. We had never shown this work. So she came to the museum on Halloween with her entourage. They were all dressed up in costumes, and she came to the temporary gallery, and she wanted 15 minutes alone with her painting before the curators and me and whomever else came to discuss the work with her, because we were going to show it starting Monday. Last Monday, we installed it. And so this is a, a really poignant moment of what we have in our collections by artists who we haven't shown ever, if it's a gift or just it wasn't in the program. So uh, that's just another aspect of how we are now mining our collections much more to show the artists who did make it to our collections but are underrepresented or never shown at all. Be careful what you wish for. Uh, the one thing I would add to that from more of a non-art background, but just in thinking about things that are challenging for me to do and perspectives that I want to share or things that I wish I could communicate through my work is um, build community, whatever that ends up meaning, whether it's fellow artists, whether it's just a group of fans who really appreciate your work, who can be your sounding board, who can be your support system. I have to continually take that advice and remember to ask for help and remember to continue to focus and invest in building community and being community for other people. I love it. Thanks so much for tackling that really broad question. So, too long didn't listen? Now I gotta remember. Distill your inspiration. Distill it down. What is driving you, right? I think we all get cut up in these application processes and the artist statements where we think we need to fill out a whole page and it's like, no, three sentences. Less is more, right? Um, then it was, be careful what you wish for. Because, you know, sometimes when you have it there, from here, you get there, and then that becomes here, and then a new there appears, right? Does everyone understand what I mean when I say that? Okay. And then lastly, your tribe. Your tribe and your community is the most important group of people. They are the ones that are going to lift you up, you're going to lift them up, and then at the end of the day, we lift each other up. And I personally think that's kind of what art's all about, is lifting us up. All right, that's enough of me talking. Let's make a big round of applause for our panelists. That's right. That's right. You can all stand up. All right, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Mad shout out to Team Art for making this happen. Thank you, Jameson, for hosting us. Thank you, thank you, thank you, SF Boba. You're wonderful. Have a great rest of your day. Happy Thursday. <laughs>